So in my head, this kind of it, it rang this huge warning bell. It was like this is like really weird. Like this is an this is not an argument that you would expect to appear in science. And so uh, when I when I looked into this uh, notion of naturalness um, further, uh, it turned out to basically be an, a beauty ideal. You know, it's like we mm -hmm. want our theories to be this way, but there is no further reason for it. I'm Brandon Vaidyanathan, and this is Beauty at Work, a podcast about how beauty works in our world and shapes the work that we do. This episode is sponsored by Templeton Religion Trust and the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies at the University of Southern California. More about them later in the show. Hello and welcome. Thanks for joining us. I'm so delighted to welcome my guest today, who is someone I've deeply admired for more than five years now, big fan of her work, Dr. Zavina Hassenfelder. Uh, she's a physicist, science communicator, author, musician, and YouTuber. She has published more than 80 research papers on topics ranging from quant quantum gravity to particle physics, cosmology, astrophysics, statistical mechanics, and quantum foundations. She's the author of two brilliant books, Lost in Math, How Beauty Leads Physics Astray, and then most recently, Existential Physics, A Scientist's Guide to Life's Biggest Questions. She's also the creative director of a super popular YouTube channel, Science Without the Gobbledygook. Sabina, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Brandon. Good to see you. You too. Great. Let's talk about what drew you to physics in the first place. Could you talk about what influenced you as, as a child, perhaps, to move in the direction of math and physics? Yeah, so um, I came to physics through the back door, so to speak. I originally studied mathematics, actually, not, not physics. And the reason I studied mathematics rather boringly was that, well, first, my, my mom uh, was a high school teacher for mathematics and biology, not physics, <laughs> biology. Ah, okay. Uh, and also, I was always good at math. Uh, and so it was the obvious thing to do. I would go and study math because, well, it seemed to be useful for something. Um, I, I was also always interested in um, science fiction. And, uh, you know, I read a lot of books about additional dimensions, uh, warp drives, hyperdrives, uh, all that kind of thing, which I thought was really fascinating, which was all very math heavy. So uh, that all makes sense to me. Uh, and then, you know, after a couple of years, um, it came to this point where I had to pick a topic to write my diploma, as was as it was called at the time. I think now they, they call it a master's thesis or whatever. But th that kind of level, after a couple of years, you have to make that decision, like, in which direction do you specialize? And I couldn't decide, <laughs> you know, it was like, it's, it, everything is great. You know, I loved it all. Uh, differential um, e equations, topology, um, higher algebra. I was super fascinated by high, higher algebra. Now, now I barely use it, but I thought it was great. And so I decided um, that the mathematics that I wanted to learn more about was that which described the real world, which uh, naturally, um, you know, directed me towards physics. And in addition to this, I had a math teacher who was at the time very interested in um, quantum gravity. So this was uh, in the mid 90s when Ashtika had just uh, come up with what's now called Ashtika's variables for uh, the quantization of um, gravity. And um, this was a math professor, but he had a seminar um, on this. So by seminar, I mean, it was like uh, a semester, like half a year. And so I, I went to this and, and for quite some time, I was under the impression that the problem of quantum gravity had been solved <laughs> by way of these variables. And it took me some time to figure out that actually not everybody agreed uh, with that. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so, um, you know, with that background, um, I uh, accepted a position as a tutor in the physics department to teach mathematics to the physicists, <laughs> the undergrad uh, students. And, you know, once I was there, they were like, uh, you should make a diploma in physics and here's your topic. 
<laughs> and and okay. so this is how I became a, a physicist. But I think it's because of this reason that I kind of, I've always had kind of a, an outsider perspective on the whole thing. I was more interested in what can you do with the mathematics? Um, what kind of mathematics? Why this mathematics? Um, is there something that we can't describe by mathematics? Are there limits to it? Uh, and how does science work in the first place? So um, in hindsight, I think I might have been better off uh, with the philosophers. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it seems like you were tuned early on to this uh, idea of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, right? As, as Winger puts it. I mean, what, 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 would, what were your thoughts on that? I mean, about the ability of mathematics to describe things in the universe that um, maybe we don't need to know as humans, you know, practically speaking. Well, I've, I've always found it weird how Wigner formulated the question, because um, I, I'd say, you know, the parts that we call the natural sciences are those parts where mathematics works very well. So the, the statement is kind of tautologically true. <laughs> they, I, I think the real question is more like, why is there some part of nature that can be described by mathematics to begin with? Like the universe didn't have to be that way. So why is it so kind to us? Uh, to which I don't have an answer, <laughs> you know. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, yeah, that's how it is, yeah. basically. Yeah, yeah. No, I've, sp I've spoken to scientists and even mathematicians who are awestruck by this by this fact. Some of them prefer to just shut the door and say, I don't want to go there. I have no idea. And others, uh, I think, have different responses. Some remain in a sense of wonder in the face of this and uh, and are convinced, there, therefore, that because we know so much, um, through this through this particular language of God, as Galileo might put it, uh, we should con continue, right, really to invest in this and and uh, trust that it'll um, not lead us astray. Which which <laughs> links to your book a little bit, which I, which I'll ask you about in a minute. Uh, I did want to ask you a little bit about what your experience was like uh, doing your doctoral and postdoctoral work, and in particular, um, were there as you talk about beauty in this book, were there things that uh, were communicated to you as as being beautiful, right, by your mentors, by your supervisors? Did they talk about certain ideas as being beautiful, or or, or the importance of beauty as a heuristic? Did that did that come up at all in your formation? Uh, it didn't, for the simple reason that the department where I made my PhD um, it was uh, nuclear physics. And nuclear physicists, you know, they don't have a lot to do with this beauty stuff that you find uh, among particle physicists and um, the, the other stuff that I ended up working on eventually. So what happened was uh, I wrote, so, I, but I wasn't really interested in the nuclear physics stuff. You know, it was mostly heavy iron physics and it, it's, it's he very heavy on the numerical side, a lot of coding and so on. I don't mean to say that it's inter uninteresting per se. It, was, it just wasn't my thing because, as I said, I was more interested in this uh, mathematical approach. So I was kind of an outsider in the Institute in that I worked on some of those fundamental questions, uh, in particular, higher dimensional black holes. And at the time it worked because there was this idea that you could create them at the um, at the LHC. So, the, you know, it, it kind of half, half fit into the department, but not very well. And so after I'd finished my PhD, I wanted to properly get into the community that I kind of felt I belonged in, like this physics beyond the standard model. So I started going to conferences on supersymmetry, you know, and, and I, uh, seminars on string theory uh, and so on. And I moved to the United States um, and <laughs> with the intention of becoming a string theorist. This is actually what I said to my okay. supervisor. You know, it was basically the first day it was like, um, what brings you to the United States? And I was like, I want to become a string theorist. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and yeah, well, it, it didn't quite go as planned uh, uh, because this is like when I was confronted with all this talk about elegance and beauty. And to me, it was really strange. You know, it, it, it's not what I expected from scientists. And so I fell into this rabbit hole where I was trying to make sense of what was going on which eventually led to my first book after 10 years or so. 
Yeah, well, I I would love to. Yeah, if you could uh, talk a little bit about that journey, because um, part of it, I mean, you know, when you when and I at least when I probably came across formulations of string theory, much you know, and much more in a much more developed state. But it sounded a lot like science fiction. It sounded even a little bit like Tolkien. His uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion, and he's got this idea of the universe having been sung into existence, or you know, something of that sort, where their music is the is the basic sort of generative principle of reality, and it it would seem I suppose appealing to someone who is uh, uh, an aficionado of science fiction to, to be drawn to something like string theory, I suppose. But you found it a little bit jarring, you say, with, with your expectations of how science ought to be conducted. Is that, is that right? Yeah, but it wasn't string theory itself that I had a problem with. It was more the community. So, um, so here's an interesting factual that I think a lot of people don't uh, fully appreciate, is that string theory actually came out of the nuclear physics community. It wasn't invented oh. as a theory of everything, um, but it was actually originally intended to describe exactly the stuff that people at my my uh, department were doing um, to describe the strong nuclear force because you get those gluon flux tubes that are like strings this is where it comes from and this is still it, it's it's now called the the lund string model after a, a city in sweden where it was invented, but it's it's kind of a string model. So this is where it came from. And then they realized through people who worked on nuclear physics, particle physics, like Veneziano, uh, most famously, that this theory seemed to describe, um, a, 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 how do you put this, you know, a tensor mode, like a, a graviton, basically, like a spin two particle. Um, and this spin two particle is believed to be the quantum of gravity. Uh, and in addition, the theory had some nice properties. And so naturally, at the time, this was like when the standard model was completed. So like in the mid 70s, roughly speaking, um, it was kind of the next thing that they wanted to do was to include gravity. And along comes this. Uh, you know, string theory, which seems to contain the graviton. So, of course, they were like, that's it. That's got to be it. And uh, I think historically, this makes complete sense. And it also made sense to me. I, I've always, you know, I found the idea very appealing. Uh, the, the, the devil is in the details, so to speak, you know, because once you look at um, what, what can I actually do with it, you you know, problems start popping up. Like, you know, at first they thought you need 26 dimensions and then they added supersymmetry and then it goes down to 11. And, you know, then you have the problem with the vacua uh, and, you know, other things, other problems with supersymmetry and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well talk a little bit about then what led you to, to write the book. Uh, I mean, because you, in Lost in Math, I mean, and it's incredibly ambitious and incredibly bold because you seem to be taking on certain kinds of orthodoxies around the the importance of uh simplicity and and elegance and and naturalness right could you could you talk a little bit about those three things and and how those criteria for beauty have um have shaped physics yeah uh before i do this i w want to tell you one more thing that maybe explains why i have this funny perspective on what's going on is that uh, when i studied mathematics i had a boyfriend who also studied mathematics um, okay. But he uh, had a second um, major, I think you would you would call it, which was sociology. Um, so I became very interested in sociology, in particular in the question like, what can mathematics tell us about sociology? So I've always had this side interest in um, you know the dynamics of groups and what can go wrong in groups. Also, partly I think because I'm German and you know some things went wrong in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, um, so, so what happened was uh, after my PhD, um, as I said, I worked on the possibility that the Large Hadron Collider could produce those tiny black holes. And um, the first time I gave a talk at an international conference about this, so not an internal thing, um, someone asked me, why would those black holes be produced at the Large Hadron Collider? Why not at even higher energies? Like, why should they become accessible right now? And the answer I gave to this was what I'd read in all the papers. Uh, it's an idea called naturalness. Uh, it's because that's natural. And yes, you could push it to higher energies, but then it would, be, it would no longer be natural. And, and this person, you know, I still see him sitting there nodded and was like, yes, okay. 
And I felt incredibly dumb because I didn't understand the answer. <laughs> you know, it was just right. something <laughs> that I'd read somewhere. And so um, in, after this conference, I tried to make up for this and tried to figure out, like, just exactly how does this argument with the naturalness goes, go. And now it's very interesting if you look in the, liter in, in the literature, like it goes back to an idea that came up in, in the early 90s or something around the time, people were very clear that this is an, an ambiguous concept. You know, it, it relies on some arbitrary assumptions about the probability distribution, but it doesn't really matter. The, the thing is that it's like it's a human construct, so to speak, and it fulfills certain you know, um, certain purposes that, uh, which is why people invented it at the time, but it was never meant to be a criterion to single out particular theories as good and other, others as bad. This is something which, um, which developed much later, which indeed, interestingly enough, by, um, Gian Giudice, um, who was, when I wrote the book, he was the head of the theory division at CERN, but I think he isn't anymore. In any case, so he's like a big, you know, um, big guy in, in the theoretical physics community. He, uh, he wrote uh, a paper, which you can read on the archive, where he says that this idea of naturalness uh, developed by a social trend or something in the, uh, in the community. Social trend is not exactly the phrase that he used, but it was something very similar. You know, I'm, I'm not good with pulling quotes out of my memory, too old for sure, this. Sure. <laughs> um, and so, like, so in my head, this kind of, it, it rang this huge warning bell. It was like, this is like really weird. Like, this is, an, this is not an argument that you would expect to appear in science. And so mm. uh, when, I, when I looked into this uh, notion of naturalness um, further, uh, it turned out to basically be an, a beauty ideal you know it's like we mm -hmm. want our theories to be this way but there is no further reason for it um there are a lot of um, scientists um theoretical physicists who have tried to come up with justifications for um this idea but they fall they all fall apart if you look at them any closer there have actually been some uh, philosophers who've written about this and so I ended up in this weird position that, um, well, I had based my PhD thesis on something which, in hindsight, uh, I don't think made any sense. So I uh, and do, do you do you mean naturalness? Was that was naturalness yeah. per se part of what you're well, saying there? Okay. It, it, so so th this is the interesting thing. It didn't actually come up in great detail in my thesis. It's just, it enters in this assumption that it becomes accessible at the ener energies that the Large Hadron Collider could produce. So it underlies all those predictions for new physics at the Large Hadron Collider. They're all based on this idea of naturalness. Let's, maybe, maybe I should ask you to specify then before, sorry, sorry, what, to, just for our listeners who don't know what naturalness means, could you sort of uh, give, a, give a brief uh, definition of that. Well, naturalness is the idea that if you write down a theory and um, you have to introduce some numbers without units, um, then those numbers should be approximately one, not exactly one, but somewhere close to one. And then we can discuss exactly how large or small can they be. You know, is three too large? Is seven too large? Uh, some people, you know, would maybe accept even 10 or 100, uh, but you wouldn't accept something like 10 to the 15. Uh, and the standard model happens to um, contain a number, actually, that's the second number, but let's stick with the, with one number that's uh, best known, uh, which is the mass of the Higgs boson divided by the Planck mass. That gives you a dimensionless number, which is about 10 to the minus 15. And uh, physicists say that's too small. It's not natural. Um, and so um, th they think it requires an explanation. And uh, this gives you justification to add all kinds of new physics, for example, supersymmetry. Or, for example, extra dimensions with, which lead to those tiny black holes. And there are lots of other things that, that you can add. They're all based on this idea that you somehow need to get rid of this small number. Now, there's, there's nothing, uh, you know, technically wrong with this number. It's just a number. <laughs> you know, you put it into the theory and it works. And that's, in fact, how people use the standard model. They just put in this number, done. So it's not like like there's mathematically there's nothing wrong with it. It's just that they don't like it. <laughs> uh, 
and 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 I didn't quite like this justification. And so what happened was after my PhD thesis, I couldn't find a justification for what I had done myself. Uh, and no one seemed to understand what my problem was in the first place. And people basically told me, I just don't understand, you know, undergrad physics. Uh, look at those lecture notes, uh, th this kind of stuff. And so I was like, okay, I don't understand what those people say, but I want nothing to do with it either. So I decided I'd stop working on it. And, and, and that's what I did. Actually turned down a pretty big grant and <laughs> all my friends um, said I'm, I'm crazy for turning it down. Um, but yeah, so I went to Perimeter and I, I worked at um, Perimeter Institute in, in Waterloo in Canada. And, and I worked on um, how to experimentally test quantum gravity for several years because I thought that was, uh, it doesn't rely on this idea of naturalness. Um, but this was all before the LHC turned on. And at this point, I was pretty convinced that all those arguments for new physics um, at the Large Hadron Collider were wrong because they were all based on this idea of naturalness. And so I started writing about it, first on my blog, um, started writing about this before the LHC turned on, I want to emphasize. <laughs> right, uh, and right, right, right. well, you know how it went, you know, um, th those new particles were never found. Um, so, and uh, after a few years of this, um, physicists began moving their predictions to higher energies because that's uh, the way the story <laughs> has been going for several decades. Uh, and uh, I just, you know, it was just obvious that at some point they'd say, we need a bigger collider. <laughs> right. And right. Uh, this is when I thought I have to write a book so people understand that this argument isn't scientific. Um, so I, and okay, we can, we can di discuss how well the public, the broad public would actually understand uh, what, what's fairly philosophical or technical argument in my book but still I felt like I have to do it because who else would do it like I was basically the only one uh, and this is why I wrote my book I, I just felt I had the responsibility to explain to people why if they put all this money in the next bigger collider it almost certainly wouldn't find something and this almost is very important because of course I can't rule it out you know it could always be um, you know they find something after all. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it's a sort of canary in a coal mine situation, right? It seems like you were, you were sort of raising the warning bells and, and pointing to the red flags as, as the LHC is, is, is taking off. And, uh, and so, so, so there's naturalness at, at, as one of the criteria that, that's being used in making these predictions. There's also, you say, simplicity and elegance. Are they also driving these predictions? Could you say a bit about those? Yeah, maybe one, sh one thing I should add is that um, the people who work on this stuff, they don't think of it as uh, beauty. You know, it's just for the most part, they just um, use it as uh, a mathematical requirement. Um, and you, you have to prod them a little bit, you know, to figure out just why do you use it, <laughs> basically. Because uh, it's not it's not necessary for mathematical consistency to assume these things. Exactly, right? that's exactly the point. It's not necessary, and yeah. So besides this naturalness, um, they use simplicity, usually in form of unification. Um, this is very prominently um, present in the idea of uh, unification of the forces in the standard model, uh, where physicists have developed new ideas starting in the 1980s, uh, and they have been falsified to the extent that they could be falsified. Um, there are still some, you know, out there, uh, which people are trying to falsify. And whenever one gets falsified, you can come up with a new one. So basically, it's not going anywhere. And then this idea of elegance is kind of, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly vague idea. Um, but that people have uh, quoted to me uh, many times, it's basically this idea that a theory um, has to give rise to surprising connections. You know, you have to get something out of simple assumptions. Um, yeah, for, for example, string theory is a theory which is often described as very elegant because it starts from this very simple um, idea. Everything is made of strings uh, and tiny interacting strings and they wiggle around and so on. But then you get out um, surprising, surprisingly many things, like, for example, um, the graviton, right? And you can also get fermions and bosons um, and gauge groups and stuff like this. So it's uh, it, it's really amazing. Yeah, yeah. 
but but yeah, but just because one set of theoretical assumptions can generate uh, these outcomes, that doesn't mean there aren't other ones out there that may not look so beautiful, right? I mean, is that part of your your argument there that that this doesn't have to be the only criteria by which we make predictions about theories, or or, or that that drive should drive theory choice? Um. Yes, it's a bit more complicated. A lot of people think that I'm a string theory critic, um, which is actually oh, not right. the case. You know, as I, as I said, I've I've always been very sympathetic to the idea of um, uh, string theory because it it solves the real problem, which is the problem of how to unify the standard model with um, uh, with gravity. So for which you need the theory of quantum gravity. Um, yeah. I, at least this is the idea. You know, technically, it's never been shown that it actually solves the problem. <laughs> so th th this is where the problem starts. I, th I think string theorists have basically given up even trying. It's They generally believe that it does, but I think formally it's never been proved. Um, so, so that's already weird. But at least in principle, I think string theory um, has a good motivation in the sense of solving an actual problem. So I don't have a huge problem with with uh, string theory, but where uh, problems start is, is stuff like supersymmetry, which, um, I mean, string theory kind of needs supersymmetry, but let's leave this aside for a moment. Um, supersymmetry is believed to be necessary to solve this naturalness problem, but I'd say it's not necessary to solve the problem to begin with. So, so what do you need supersymmetry for? <laughs> Um, and, and I mean, su supersymmetry is not just one model, it, you know, it's a huge number of mo uh, different types of models. It, it's really complicated, which is why there have been so many papers written about it, because um, there's so much stuff that you can explore in this great mathematical space. But as you correctly say, just because you can write it down and it looks pretty doesn't mean it actually describes reality. And there are lots of theories that you can write down that look good on paper, but they just don't describe the universe that we live in. Yeah, yeah. So so is this massive sort of generation of papers around beautiful mathematics, some kind of mathematical masturbation? Or like, what do you, what do you see as driving this kind of uh, pursuit, right? I mean, I think you, one of the things you point out is is just the abundance of uh, papers that are being written, and even even um, the the abundance of journals. And I, I I read some recent statistic that seventy percent of the publications these days in, in scientific uh, journals are not read by anybody. Uh, and I wonder how how this sort of the this, the social context of science is is driving some of some of what you're seeing here. I think it's a generational thing. So um, I think that the people who originally started working on this, as I said, you know, after the standard model was completed, they had, you know, pretty good motivations. And it made sense, you know, that the next thing that you'd look at would be a grand unification or string theory, so you could include the graviton. But then over the course of time, um, this didn't work out and uh, people just started making those models more and more complicated. And it's around this time that things started going wrong. You know, then there were um, experiments coming in and they falsified some of those theories, but they didn't get the message. You know, they just continued doing the same thing over and over again. And then at some point, I think people learned that you can get away with it. You know, you can do it. You can publish those papers, even though there's no evidence for it. Uh, and even if they are falsified, you just move on to the next thing and that pays the rent. So it becomes this this big bubble of nothing. And uh, I, I think that they're not really aware of that this is what's going on because you've if you've grown up in this community, of and I mean they're all serious scientists, you know. It's not like they're frauds or something. Um, they all believe it, and it's really hard to go and say, "Well, actually, this doesn't make any sense." <laughs> you know, why are you doing this if you have like several thousand people telling you that? But of course, that's the thing to do. And this isn't something which is specific to um, particle physics. Uh, I find it interesting that a very similar thing has happened in uh, psychology. Uh, and parts of uh, sociology where they had this issue with the, uh, you know, sloppy measures of statistical significance, which is something that mathematicians and uh, st statisticians um, ha have been writing and warning about for decades. So it wasn't it wasn't that it was difficult to realize, <laughs> but they did it because everyone did it. It's what they you know that's what they were taught to do, and they thought it was okay. 
So, um, and as I said, it becomes really difficult if you if you are in this community. This is how you make your income, uh, and and it's okay because you can get it published. Then you continue doing it. So, how, how, so that's the interesting question: is then how do you how do you stop something like this? And the psychologists manage to do it, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, and they're still. I mean, they are still struggling with the the reproducibility replicability crisis and and with p hacking and so on. Um, we still don't have enough respect for null findings, and so we we're constantly chasing after whatever you can, you know, demonstrate as being statistically significant, which is easy to manipulate. So, um, but I mean, I, I mean, these are these are really powerful biases that you point out, right? I mean, groupthink and social desirability and the sunk cost fallacy and. Uh, and then this big blind spot that that scientists of all people, uh, you know, would would see themselves as being immune to these biases. So, so how did how what was the reaction to your book? I mean, how did scientists respond to it? Were were there people willing to say, "Gosh, I, you know, I, I realized that this bias was driving me," or did they did they sort of reject your argument, or what, what was what's it been like? There was basically no reaction from people in the community, at least not that I wow. I've heard. It's not that anyone came to me and said, oh, you know, the, your book really made me think <laughs> it just didn't happen. Um, but, I mean, he, he, you know, I've been very vocal about it and I've I've made fun of particle physicists uh, deliberately, I have to admit. Um, uh, and uh, it's interesting if you look at interviews uh, that particle physicists give um, on both sides, they don't talk about beauty anymore. This used to be really, really common, you know, in public um, in public outreach, uh, in um, popular science books, uh, in, in on all those pages. They would go on about how beautiful it is, and you know, unification, string theory, and and, and so on and so forth. They don't do this anymore. So I I I think I reached some people. <laughs> At least, uh, yeah, at least yeah. they seem to have realized that this isn't something that scientists should openly admit. <laughs> uh, whether whether they actually stop doing it, that, that's another question entirely. Yeah, I mean, there are, you know, um, I mean, so on the one hand, so our data where we studied, you know, um, what scientists think about some of these statements, like you know, Dirac's claim that it's more important to have beauty in one's equations than to have them fit experiment. You know, most physicists would reject those sorts of claims and. Um, most scientists seem quite circumspect and, and would say that beauty can be useful. You know, it's it's fine to invest in a, in a beautiful hypothesis, but let, let let don't don't be misled. You know, like make make sure that there's experimental validation and so on. But I mean, one one problem I suppose is that regardless of what individual scientists think, it's the it's the leaders in these communities that really you know it's where the money is, or or it's it's you know who's driving. Uh, particular research programs, and they they were they're the ones who get to decide really what 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 you invested, in. and so uh, there are it seems prominent scientists. I mean, I'm thinking of people like Frank Wilczek, who I think you know is pretty outspoken about how beauty is a kind of um, you know we can have insight into something like the mind of God, you know, through the the, the the idea that nature embodies beautiful ideas, and and we can access those ideas through mathematics, and and therefore we should invest in this direction. I mean, what do you think of the influence of uh, scientists who who do have a strong sort of conviction about the role of, of beauty as a heuristic? Are you seeing that as still uh, shaping the field, or do you think that's changed? Well, as I said, I, I see less of it. Yes, there's Frank Wilczek. Um, that's that's true. But you know, it's if there's one peop one person here or there, um, th that's not the big problem. Um, the problem is if if you have a large group of people, uh, and not only um, do they believe that beauty actually helps you discover new laws, but they also all use the same notion of beauty. Uh, and in addition, as I said previously, in many cases, they don't even think about it as some beauty. So if you ask them a question like, um, you know, do you agree with Dirac on uh, this quote and so on and so forth, they put on their scientist hat and uh, most of them would say, ah, oh. oh, no, you shouldn't do this uh, as a good scientist. No, certainly not. <laughs> okay. But, uh -huh. but then they use some criterion like naturalness because they think it's just mathematics. That's what we have learned to do. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't trigger a warning. Let me put it this way. Yeah. So it's so it's, so it's kind of baked into their their processes. If if, if it's even if it's not sort of uh, consciously being applied. Um, I mean, and a lot of uh, I want to ask about existential physics, which sort of resonates with some of these claims uh, where where you're arguing that I think a lot of uh, the kinds of questions 
that are being pursued in fields like theoretical physics are not even scientific questions, right? They're ascientific, or or is that the the right way? You, is that how you put it? Like like what kinds of what kinds of questions are these? I suppose that that are driven by these kinds of beautiful mathematics. I'd say it's not really the questions themselves that are ascientific, but more the ideas that people come up with to answer the questions. Um, be, because they're, they're just ideas that you that you can't test. Uh, for example, this is stuff like um, the existence of other universes is like a typical example. Um, and I call them um, ascientific because um, it's not that, that they're wrong, but it's that science can't tell you whether it's right or wrong. It's, it's not possible. It's like the idea of God. Right. You can say, OK, God exists, uh, but we can't observe him or her. <laughs> uh, and science just says, OK, uh, so what? You know, do whatever you want uh, is fine. It's not that it's wrong. Uh, we can't tell you whether it's wrong or right. And the idea of uh, additional universes uh, is, is, is one of that sort. Um, this is maybe the most obvious one. You know, I, I think most people would see that. Um, but there are some which uh, are a little bit less obvious. Uh, for, for example, there's like the question, uh, what happened at the beginning of the universe or even before the Big Bang? Um, where I'd say, well, we, we can't tell because, uh, well, f first of all, we don't have the observations that date back long enough in the history of the universe. And it's highly questionable we'll ever have the data. And there are actually good reasons to think, just looking at the type of theory that we use, that it's actually impossible to go back uh, beyond a certain point in time. Uh, and beyond that time in the past, you can do whatever you want, you know, and it's not that it's wrong. <laughs> it could be right, but we'll never know if it's right or wrong. And I would say that's ascientific. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, I recall, you know, people like Jim Baggett talking about uh, things like the multiverse theory as being, you know, a fairy tale physics or something like that. I mean, that it's not even, or, or Peter White is saying this stuff is not even wrong. We don't even know what to call it. Um, but but is it, a, is it a question that then, then, then this is not something that scientists should pursue? Or is it that, look, we're allocating public funding to various things and, and you know, particularly something like the Large Hadron Collider requires public investment. Is it a question of that, like, let's think about how we should direct our resources and maybe there are other more pressing problems that we should be directing our resources to? Uh, I mean, is that part of the, the concern here? I have to admit that my concern with people who work on multiverse things is not very much about the funding because it's very few people and they're not very expensive. Okay. Um, so, okay. you know, it's not a big deal. Um, my major issue with the multiverse is the same as, as uh, Jim Baggott's, um, is that this public perception, like, um, a, a, as you say, like, this is not something that scientists should work on. Why do they do it anyway? You know, um, why, um, why do they think it's even science? There's something really going wrong. And because it's so obvious to see uh, for people, I, I think it... Um, sheds a bad light on, um, on, on science in general. You know, it's not that I have a problem with people working on it, but I think that they should be clearer that it's not science. There's a lot of super interesting uh, themes that you tackle in, in existential physics. I mean, particularly the, this question of even life after death in, 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 the, in, the, in the block universe. And uh, I wonder if you could comment on that, because there's... Um, the idea that we, you know, we exist as information, and 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 after death, potentially this information could be reconstructed at some point in the future is is a really fascinating idea, and I and I think um, uh, maybe maybe a sign, you know, of hope for for a lot of people. I don't know. What what do you think of this particular idea, and what can science tell us? About so this? I don't think I said anything about whether it can be reconstructed. Um, though though right, 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 I can right. see that yeah. people extrapolate uh, to this. Uh, I think what I said is that for all we currently know about the laws of nature, the information that makes up you can't be destroyed. Um, so it's still there, and yeah, God knows, maybe in the in the you know I don't know ten to one hundred billion years or something, someone will figure out how to reconstruct you. Um, I don't know. Uh, it, it's possible because the information can't get destroyed, and uh, yeah. So um, there, there there are two reasons um, I I think that this is probably correct. Uh, the one is um, the this weird 
block universe, the idea that all of space time, not just space, but space and time exists in the same way. So um, it's not just this present moment that exists, but actually all moments, they, they all have to exist in the same way. So this is like, this is a logical consequence uh, of Einstein's theory of special and general relativity, which I think Einstein himself was very <laughs> confused about, uh, which is why he said he, he worries about this idea of the now, like where does it come from? Where, where I'd say, well, this is like some complicated neurological, <laughs> I don't know what, you know, it's not, not my discipline. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, so for, for what the mathematics of his theories uh, is concerned, uh, we, we live in this block universe where the future, the present and the past exists in the same way. So then, then you have the, the possibility, you can either say, well, nothing exists, basically, none of those times, or they all exist. And the other reason is the, the type of um, natural law that we deal with, which um, basically just tells you how matter is reconfigured. Um, and you can, it's, it's a set of rules expressed by differential equations, and you can run them forwards and backwards. Um, it's called time reversibility. And with two exceptions that I could talk about for several hours, <laughs> which are black holes and the measurement process in quantum mechanics, um, or, or the last laws of physics can be run forwards and backwards. And so this means basically that, that if you put all the information in, in, in one initial state, in one configuration at one time, uh, you can calculate what happens at any later and also what happened at any earlier time. So this information is never really gone. Uh, does this mean that there's life after death? Um, well, it depends on what you mean, mean by life, right? So if someone dies, then all this information uh, spreads out throughout the universe, basically, and you can't communicate with the person anymore. So I'm afraid it's, it's a very philosophical argument, but I actually believe it to be correct. Yeah, yeah. No, I think, and then, yeah, it raises some really interesting questions as to how to think about um yeah, certainly the nature of time. And also, I think it has implications for free will, right? I think uh, you, you, your, your book raises some questions as to what science can tell us about the existence of free will. And I wonder, I mean, for a lot of people existentially, free will has more to do with how much control I have over my own actions, how much responsibility. And typically, that's the kind of context in which people think about it. How responsible should somebody be held to, right? So this is the question of, of, of justice and so forth that you know were my actions determined or or did I have some sort of free will and so but you're not dealing with it in that sense it seems well I so in my book I do go on a little bit about uh, moral responsibility because people always bring this up it seems to be the point that philosophers are very very concerned with um, I find it to be a little bit of a red herring because I think you can reframe all those questions about moral responsibility in terms of interventions like, uh, what are we going to do? Does it make sense to put this person into jail? Is it going to solve the problem? If it solves the problem, then the person was responsible. <laughs> you know, yes. if putting them in jail doesn't make any difference, then maybe somebody else or something else uh, was responsible for it. And so it, it becomes a question um, of inferring the most dominant causes uh, that created a certain situation, something like this. And I know this all sounds very technical and, and abstract, and I don't want to tell anyone that this is the language they need to use. You know, if they want to continue talking about free will and moral responsibility, this is all fine. I'm just saying you don't really need it. If you wanted to, you could, you could come to the same conclusions uh, without it. And uh, yeah, you, you, you're right. So, so this approach to free will, uh, talking about um, how free am I from uh, constraints in my environment? You know, how, how autonomous can I make my decisions? Uh, or do I just act, uh, you know, like a toaster, someone switches the button and you go, bloop. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is not how yeah. we think about ourselves. Um, so there are different ways that people have tried to give uh, meaning to this notion of free will. Yeah, yeah, and I think it has a lot of interesting uh, relationships to philosophical positions where, you know, autonomy or responsibility in some positions is really what makes us human. And, the, you know, so if you take that away, that ability to sort of control one's own destiny, then that entire sort of philosophy starts to lose its appeal. 
Um, and so I think people might be concerned about those sorts of things. But I'm curious to know as to as to whether you've yourself experienced any done anything differently, I suppose, in your life as a result of of thinking through these issues or or as as your own scientific research has progressed. Have you changed anything existentially, let's say, <laughs> about about your own life? Um, yes, I actually have. Um, so um, both regarding the first book and the second book. So maybe let's uh, start with this question of free will because we were just talking about it. Um, so um, I think that this idea of free will, which um, I think people are tied to it just because they've grown up with it. You know, it's it's how we've been explained. Our brain works and it's very strongly anchored, especially in, in Christian religion. It's really important, this free will thing. Um, so I think it suggests to us that um, we have more influence on what goes on in our own brain than it's actually the case. And um, it's, you know, I think the realization that free will doesn't actually exist, at least that's what I would say, has made me more aware of being really careful with what kind of information I let into my brain in the first place, because I can't get it back out again, you know. Uh, yeah, once it's in, it's in. Uh, and this has a lot to do with, uh, you know, filtering the information that you consume in a day. And it also ties into this question with the with the cognitive biases. You know, there's just the human brain works in a certain way. Uh, if there's something that you hear repeatedly from people who you trust, you're very likely to believe it. And I, I think this drives a lot of this stuff in uh, the physics community. And it's also why I thought eventually I have to go and, and come out with my with my first book, uh, because uh, I felt like I was you know, subject to exactly the same environment. And I should not agree with them just because so many people say it. And yeah, so and and from the first book, the lesson that I've drawn is basically about the way that I pick my own research topics. So, I, you know, I try to actually um, <laughs> walk the talk. <laughs> right, right. That's great. Um, you have you have a, a really uh, Beautiful quotation that 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 struck me uh, about uh, science communication and 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 in your second book, and you you say that uh, alongside public lectures, we should offer opportunities for lecture attendees to get to know one another, and instead of panel discussions among prominent scientists, we should talk more about how scientific understanding made a difference for non-experts. Instead of letting researchers answer audience questions, we should listen and learn from those who have been helped through difficult times by scientific insights. Uh, clear View of the Night Sky, a book on embryology, an online course in psychology, um, you know, all this sort of stuff. I mean, so I, I would love to, to hear your thoughts on on, on what might um, better science communication look like, particularly in light of what you just talked about, these different sources of information we're getting. We seem to be, at least in America, living in silos where we are conditioned only by, you know, certain kinds of channels of information. Uh, so, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on what could what can break us out of those those silos and what role science could play in in, in helping uh, you know build solidarity? <laughs> it, it's funny you'd mention uh, the United States because I actually think that science communication in the United States works much better than it does in Germany. <laughs> Because, oh, wow. uh, yeah, okay. I mean, at, at least you have some support for it. Uh, and I think uh, politicians and, and a big part of the public understand how important it is. So in, in Germany, it's really, really difficult to um, get support to do anything in uh, science communication. Like, I, I've never been paid uh, to work in science communication. And last time I looked, the only support that you could get was to communicate your own research, which, you know, is better than nothing. But it's not always a good idea to let the people who work on the stuff <laughs> advertise it, if you see yeah. what I mean. Right. Um, so uh, what can we do better? I, I think they're good. there's good stuff going on, but it's not, it's not a lot of it. Um, for example, one community who's doing really well uh, integrating uh, with the interesting public are astronomers, you know, with, with observatories. Uh, they tend to have regular meetings. Everyone has the telescope, looks at the night sky, you know, they try to take pictures. They talk about the pictures, uh, you know. It's, it's, it's a very social thing. And I think that's great. And I think that other areas of science could try to learn something from it. Okay, you know, not everyone's going to build their own particle collider in their backyard, that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, I, I think yeah. we could do... Yeah, what do you you see in a lot of science communication is that you have you have this very strong division between the person who's lecturing and then there's the audience 
uh, right? And, and I, I, I think we could try to uh, integrate uh, a little better, make, make this a little bit uh, more social to not give people the idea that we're talking down to them. Yeah, no, I think that's really crucial. In fact, in one, of, one of the main motivators for our research on, on this project on beauty and science was to figure out whether better emphasizing what scientists found beautiful in their work. And I don't mean just sort of those narrow, rigid types of beauty, but, but also the beauty of the stars and the beauty of phenomena they study, but especially the, the, the beauty of, of understanding. You know, we wondered whether that uh, could help. A lot of scientists told us we were being naive, and they thought that... Uh, Scientific facts, no matter how beautiful, will only be filtered through people's political priors. But but our question is is maybe it's not the beauty of facts, but rather the beauty of understanding. And I think your your book points to the the, the centrality of understanding. You know that that ability to gain an insight into how reality works, even in a small way, requires some kind of intellectual humility. You have to be willing to change your mind. You have to perhaps even be able to find changing your mind pleasurable. Um, and I wonder how we might cultivate that kind of sensibility, uh, that kind of beauty of understanding. Well, yeah, th that's a very good point. Uh, I think it, um, it it comes back to this social acceptance, uh, basically. I think when, in, in many cases, you see this on social media a lot, when people change their mind, um, they kind of feel like they're getting punished. Right, mm. because people make jokes mm. of them, mm. like, "Hey, two years ago you said something else, right? right. Look, here's your yeah. tweet yeah. from," uh, yeah. and so on. Uh, and uh, I think that's that's really bad, you know. Um, personally, I'm glad if I see a politician change their mind, because it tells me that they can integrate new evidence. You know, they've learned something new. Um, so um, I hope that maybe we can try to change this mindset a little bit um, that, to make people feel more comfortable by telling them, okay, if you change your mind, that's great. You know, that's exactly what you should do if you learn something new. And I, I also think a lot of uh, people who, um, you know, d d deny that uh, climate change is uh, caused by humans who are still around, it's probably, this is my suspicion, is because 30 years ago, that was still kind of compatible with evidence. You know, it was an acceptable position to hold. And they kind of, they missed the bus, <laughs> you know. Mm. They didn't jump off at the point where they should have. And now they're kind of locked in this position where they feel like they would embarrass themselves if they admit they'd been wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you've done really extraordinary work with science communication. And, and I think at the end of the book, you, you talk about how you came to the same conclusion as your mother about the, the meaning of life. Could you, could you, could you talk about um, your own sense of, of meaning and mission in relation to science and, and how that uh, shapes what you do now and, and what you hope to do next? Yeah, there's uh, another very good question because it returns us to the beginning, which uh, is, is, is a very nice way uh, to end. Yeah, so as I said, my, my mom uh, is a now retired high school teacher. And uh, so she, she told me that her idea of the meaning of life is to pass on knowledge. And as you can see, I kind of do the same thing. I didn't want to become a teacher <laughs> because I didn't want to do the same thing that my mom did. But I'm, I'm also passing on knowledge. And um, you, you started asking about this question, like uh, about the uh, unreasonable uh, effectiveness of uh, uh, mathematics and the natural sciences. And I think one of the one of the reasons, and this is like pure speculation, you know, <laughs> uh, is that um, our brains are kind of capable uh, of forming a model of the universe. Because this is, to me, this is what it means that we are able to do science, that we are able to, uh, you know, extract these abstract patterns, this mathematics from our observations. It's because it maps to something in our brain. We can, we can deal with this. So in some sense, we're kind of similar to the universe, which brings up the question like, why? <laughs> and where is it going? And uh, so I've been wondering if not... Um, where the universe is going to, we kind of know that complexity is increasing, is trying to better understand what itself is doing through us. So in some sense, I'm, I'm part of the attempt of the universe trying to understand itself. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. That's a, that's a very 
It's a very spiritual way of phrasing it, right? So we are the, the universe's self-consciousness as it, as it moves forward. Um, and, and yeah, lots of brilliant parallels, uh, uh, intersections between science and religion and spirituality in your book. And um, uh, where can we direct readers to, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the, the work you're doing, where, where, where can we uh, direct our listeners, our viewers, our readers? It's very easy. You just enter my name in your search engine of choice and uh, you'll learn more about me than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> my, my name is not very common, so it's, it's really not hard to find. Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll put all the links in our show notes. And uh, what's next for you? Are you working on another book? I know your, your channel is brilliant and I really enjoy watching your, your, your news feeds, your, your analysis of all the science news. But uh, what's, what's, uh, what's your next project if there's a big one on the horizon? Well, I'm, I'm still working on trying to solve the, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. <laughs> so I hope that in, in, in the next time I'll, I'll be able to spend a little more time on this again, doing a little bit more research again. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you again so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. <laughs> Good to talk to you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching. If you liked that video, please hit that thumbs up button and share it with your friends. Also, please take a second to hit the subscribe button because it really helps us out. Thanks.